Hey everyone, in today's video, I plan on walking you through the different parts of my math block or a typical math block that I had in a K through two classroom. Now I have done tons of videos in the past. I have an entire math activities playlist over here on YouTube where I will share kind of different activities that I would plug into my math block, but I've gotten many questions over the past year or so about what does, what's the layout of my math block look like, right? Teachers wanna know, okay, what do you do first? How long do you spend in each of these time periods? What's the overall look? So that's what I'm addressing in today's video. I'm gonna walk you through each of the parts of my math block and share the types of activities that I do in each part. So if you're ready to see this video, give it a like, subscribe to my channel, and let's dive in. Okay, so I went back and looked at a few of my old schedules from back when I taught in Las Vegas, when I taught a couple different schools here in Massachusetts, and on average, my math block was about 50 to 60 minutes. Now, I had one school I worked at, it was an extended day school, so my math block was actually 110 minutes, which was very nice, I got to fit in pretty much everything we needed. And then at another school I worked in, it was closer to about 45 minutes. So somewhere in the middle is about an hour, around 50, 55 minutes, let's say. So for the purpose of this video, I'm going to use a 50 minute time block to share how long I would spend in each one. That way I'd rather cater it towards people who have a lesser amount of time, because if you have a longer amount of time, you can more easily kind of add in minutes where you need them. So before we start, I would love to know from you, how long is your math block? Do you get to decide this? Does your district decide? Does your school decide? Uh, how long do you have to teach math? Let me know down in the comments. Okay, before I go into each part individually, let me just give you a brief overlook of what my schedule kind of looks like. So here are the four main components of my math block. We always start up top with a warm up, and that takes about five minutes. And then we go on to a mini lesson, which is about 15 minutes. That includes a few different parts. It's not just me talking for 15 minutes straight, um, which I will go into in a little bit. Third is the longest period of time. And this is about 30 minutes long, and this will be independent or partner practice. Um, this includes quite a few different parts to it, which I will go over, but this is also when I am pulling small groups or working with students individually as needed. And then at the end, I actually didn't even assign a time to this um, because really I'd stop, you know, independent practice about two minutes early because the closing is just one to two minutes just to check in before we move to our next subject. So I follow the same four parts every time. So it is warm up, it is mini lesson, then over to practice, 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 and then a quick closing. So now I'm gonna go into each little part and just share some example activities and what that might look like and sound like in my classroom. Okay, the first portion is the math warm up, and this takes about five minutes. Now I have done a bunch of videos on math warm ups in the past. Here's a popular one that I have where I share five, I think five of my favorite math warm ups that students play, um, and those are more like games and activities that are very quick. But our math warm up is kind of the place where we're getting our we're getting our brains ready to learn about math. It's also a place where we like to review older skills before we dive into something new. But most importantly, this time, this math warm up, this five minutes is really when I hold most of my math talks. Now I have done tons of videos on different math talks. Here's one with math talk sentence stems to use. Here's one with some of my favorite like math talk warm ups that you can do. I had a whole series on number sense routines. Again, all of these are really going to focus on building meaningful conceptual math talk with your students and this is the time to do it. What's great about this five minutes is it doesn't need to be connected to what you're going to be teaching. You can be doing an entire lesson um, where you're gonna teach the attributes of 3D shapes, but your math talk, your warm up, can talk about you know place value. It can talk about tens and ones. It can be kind of like a logic puzzle, an odd one out situation where students have to look at a puzzle and talk about why they think one doesn't belong. I recently came out with this bundle right here. It is an entire year's worth of math talk slides that you can just throw up on the board and they are ready for students to talk about. Each slide is definitely not going to take five minutes in total and the skills kind of build off one another so you can easily run through you know three to five slides during one of your math warm-ups to get students really talking about each skill. 
I'll go ahead and link those slides down in the description below. Each of the individual skills that's included in that bundle there is also sold separately. So if you just want some slides for subitizing, or if you want those picture talks, or if you want decomposition, whatever skill you wanna work on, you can try them out individually instead of getting the bundle if that's better for you. I'll also go ahead and link some of the math talk or math warm up videos that I have down there too, in case you wanna check those out and gather some other ideas. Now, before I move on to the next portion of the math block, I want to mention that my calendar time was separate from my math block. So if you do a calendar time in kindergarten, first or second grade, some people usually kick off their math block that way. I like to either do it in the morning this is, I've had two separate times where I did it. Sometimes I would do it in the morning, right after morning meeting. And uh, at another school, I actually did it right after recess time. It was a nice way to kind of come in from a loud, busy, bustling recess time and sit down and do calendar, because that only takes a few minutes as well. So I kind of separated the two. Calendar would be separate. This time was really a time for some good math talk. All right, after the warm up, part number two is going to be the mini lesson. And this is about 15 minutes long, but I told you there's a few different parts to it. So the three parts that are usually included in my mini lesson are number one, review previous skills. Number two, teach new concepts. And number three, guided practice. So the part where you're reviewing yesterday's work, this is only going to take a few seconds. It might just be a sentence or two. Essentially, you're going to say, all right, students, yesterday we learned about X, Y, Z. You might, you know, have a little highlight that somebody did in class yesterday. You might bring up a game or activity you learned. Whatever it is, you might want to show students again real quickly on the board what they discussed, but this is only about a minute. It's just to kind of reignite uh, what they learned about, have students remember before we move to new concepts. Then you go right into the objective for today. So class, today we are going to learn about different combinations of 10. We're going to see how we can combine numbers to make the number 10, for example. You will tell them their objective and then this is when you are going to really do the main bulk of your teaching. You are going to teach students maybe the different combinations to make 10. You're going to use manipulatives and show them how it works. You're going to think aloud so students can hear you reason with these numbers and with these skills. This is when you are going to be as explicit and concrete as possible because this is your whole group instruction and you need to reach as many learners as you can during this time before we, you know, pull students in small group to work on smaller things. So this is when you are explicit, you're drawing things on the board or you're using actual manipulatives and you're really just laying it out as simply as you can, whatever the math skill is. If there are any big common glaring misconceptions about whatever skill you're teaching, this is the time to address it now in front of all the students. After you've done that, which probably takes about 10 minutes, this is where the guided practice will come in. So let's pretend you were teaching students, you know, the different combinations of 10, and then you want to show them an activity where they are going to practice this themselves. This is where you are going to be, you know, teaching them a new game or a new activity, but you are there to kind of witness all of it, right? So what I like to do is if I am teaching students a new activity that they're going to practice, I like to have them all sit in a circle um, on the rug and and I will sit in the middle of the circle. If you have a doc cam and you want students to go ahead and sit at their seats and all look up at the doc cam, that's also totally fine. You just wanna make sure you can kind of check in with students and I find when we're all sitting on a rug, I'm, you know, the proximity is a little closer for me and them. Um, and I feel like they pay attention slightly better, but that's just me. So then I will show students the type of activity that they're doing. Let's pretend it's some type of decomposition game, since I said we're learning combinations of 10. So I will have students, you know, put 10 double-sided counters, those red and yellow counters in a bag, um, and then have them kind of drop them, see how many turn red, see how many turn yellow, and then they can write a number sentence. I hope this makes sense, but I'm just trying to think of an example off the top of my head. So I will show them in a circle on the rug how to do this. I will do it once or twice, and then I will have different students come over and practice it, and we will kind of write it on the board so they can all see how it's done. This guided practice time, along with that mini lesson where you're doing a lot of talking, is a great time to kind of see what student misconceptions are um, when they're actually doing the game and you involve them and you have different students, you know, answer what's next or how do we write this number sentence or, okay, you come up and 
you drop the counters down, whatever it is, you might start to notice that, oh wait, students don't know how to do this just yet, or students thought we had to do that, or maybe they didn't explain this well enough. This will be another good time to clear up misconceptions before they go off to practice on their own. Okay, so just to review that mini lesson portion, you have a very quick review of what we did yesterday. You are explicitly teaching all new skills for today's lesson. Uh, try to keep them concrete with either pictures on the board, manipulatives or whatever. And then you're doing some guided practice where this is just you involving students and showing them how to do something new, whether it's um, that concrete activity that you did during the mini lesson. This is where you kind of involve them or at least a portion of them, even though we're all sitting close together because you're then going to send them off to do it themselves, which is next. All right, this practice portion is the longest portion of the math block. Like I said, it's usually about 30 minutes. If you're going to add some time, you could add it here or you could add it to that guided practice. Sometimes actually in my, um, the block I had, I told you it was like an hour and 10 minutes long. I would actually kind of separate the guided practice and I would have that be a longer session where I could walk around to each group um, and I would actually show them how to do it in a circle and then I would send them off as still like this guided practice and I wouldn't pull groups yet. I would walk around and make sure everybody's understanding what's going on before we went to this next part. Just as a little FYI and another option if you have a longer math block. Now on to practice, this can be done many different ways. So I will just tell you two of the main ways I have done it in the past. After I go through this, if you have other ways you kind of run this portion, let me know down in the comments so teachers can gather other ideas. So you'll wanna see what works for you. I think one of the most common ways, and this was the first thing I did when I was teaching, is to have a rotation, like center rotations. So if it's 30 minutes, you might have about, you know, seven and a half minutes at each station that students can rotate through. Now, if you're doing four centers, I would have one of those centers be the game or the activity that you just did with the class during that guided practice. So they will have a chance to then go ahead and do that without you there to continue practicing. Then the other three stations should all be review things or things that you've already taught previously. So students should already know how to play the game, how to complete the center. They shouldn't have many questions about it because otherwise it's gonna be really hard for you to pull small groups if you're answering all these little questions and putting out all these little mini fires. So this is definitely a review time. If you do have iPads or computers, if you have access to Seesaw or Google and you have math centers in there, that can be its own center as well. Um, so that way it's a little more differentiated. My slight problem with centers in the past was making sure that um, it was differentiated for students because even if I put them in like homogeneous groups, um, I would have to change out the centers each time. So that, that made it a little bit more difficult. There are ways around that. Um, that teachers have found great success with. So if that is you, awesome. But my second option is something that I started doing a little bit later in my teaching career, and it's something that I've enjoyed the most, and it's a little more independent. And this option was something I did called Math Bins. So here's a picture. This was one of my first grade classrooms right here. I have eight different math bins, and they are all labeled here. So each of my students would have a math partner that they would work with, and that partner was at the same math ability as they were, so as close as possible. Um, so that way they could work together on different bins. And within each of those bins were review centers, but they were essentially differentiated, right? So I knew that bins one, two, and three were going to be bins that my higher level students would have success with. Those were bins that met their needs a little bit more. Bins four, five, and six were for my, you know, on grade level students, or again, this was more skills based. So if we're talking about addition, maybe one, two, and three had addition to 20 already when three, four, and five, or four, five, and six had addition to 10. And then bin seven and eight really focused on like one through five or even number sense skills. So my students would know up on the board them and their partner what bins they would have to go through. So here's an example of what that board might look like in my classroom. And this is something you could either display on the smart board or back in the day when I didn't have a smart board, it was just written out on the board with a marker. And sometimes I had different magnet tiles that would um, move for them. But here this top group of students would know they're going to go and do bin two and bin three before they go off to their iPads. And now over on their iPads, they might have some seesaw activities they have to complete, or you might have approved math sites or math games that they can do, that's up to you. Um, but I liked this because students would kind of run through it at their own pace. So that pair of partners would go ahead, they would play the game in bucket two, 
or math bin number two. My centers and games always have a like ending point. They don't just continuously go on. So once the game was finished, they would put the materials back in bin two. Then they would go to bin three. They would play that game. Um, and then if they finished that, they would go to Seesaw. Now sometimes, depending on the day, every student would have to finish with their math partner the guided practice activity first, and then they knew, okay, when we're done with that, we'll put that back and we'll go to two and then three and then Seesaw, etc. So as you can see, this is much more kind of free flowing than the timed rotations where you put a timer up and then boom, everybody clean up and move. And I personally liked this a little bit better. Some teachers think this is their worst nightmare. They're like, this sounds like mayhem because you have groups moving all over the classroom. Um, but really, once you get the routine down, I love the independence that it can build. So again, that was something that worked for me. As for what would go in the math bins or the center rotations, I used a lot of my print and play math games. Um, I've had the first grade set for like six or seven years now. Um, we also have a kindergarten set that just came out and then we are working on the second grade set. It already has addition there, but these print and play partner games, like I said, they have a starting point, they have an ending point. A lot of times they'll have a winner so you know when it's done. Um, and they are all super easy to use by just printing them out and then playing either with dice, um, sometimes you might need a spinner or some cubes, and anything that the game would need, I would keep in the math bin. Or if you're doing rotations, you would just keep it in a bin in the middle of the table and students would rotate around. Now, as the last part of this portion, while students were rotating in their centers or while they were working through their math bins, this is when I would pull small groups. So this is when I would meet with small groups to work on specific skills, especially my students that were behind, but also this was an extension time. I would meet at least once a week with my higher level learners to give them something new to practice. Um, and then if it was something new they could practice, this is also something they could do during that center's time, maybe the next day, right? I might teach them a new game or activity um, and have them do that first before going to the math bins. Now I will say about 90% of the time I was pulling small groups during this portion, but also some days I would just like to kind of walk around and check in with what students are doing. This is when I could see whether students needed to kind of move up on a skill or an activity. I could take some quick notes as I walk around with my students. I could see, okay, we need to change out center number two or math bin number two. Everyone's kind of exceeded that. We need to move on to something else, etc. So most of the time I am pulling small groups, but sometimes I'm just walking around and taking notes, jumping in where I'm needed. Okay, and last but not least, the last part of my math blog, which is very short but still is included every single day, is the closing. This might be only one or two minutes long, and it's pretty simple. There are many different ways you can do this, but sometimes I would simply ask my students an important question from the mini lesson, like come up with two different ways to make the number 10 for our example, and I would actually have them share it with their math partner first um, and then share some of their answers aloud. Other times I might do the closure by highlighting something great that I saw during the math time, whether it was in my small groups or whether I was circulating, I might share like a light bulb moment or I love the way so-and-so did this. I love the way so-and-so worked through this. I might share a little something like that or especially if there's been a big misconception that keeps happening around a topic, this would be another time to clear that up during the closing. So again, I usually don't even attach like a time limit to this one. It's about one or two minutes. It's very quick, but I find that it is important to do before we move on to our next subject. Phew. Okay. So those are the main parts of my math block and what my math block looked like each and every day as a K through two teacher. Just to go over it one last time, it is that five minute warm up. It is that mini lesson where we are reviewing old skills. We're teaching our new concepts and doing any guided practice. Then we go into practice, 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 whether you do it through centers or math bins. And this is also where you meet with your students. And then we always have a closing at the end. So I would love to know from you, how does your math block differ from this? Does it look basically the same um, during that kind of practice time? Do you like rotations? Do you like them doing it independently? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up so I know. Make sure you are subscribed to my channel and click that bell. That way you're notified of any new video. See you in the next one. Bye.